Hi, in this tutorial we'll cover the Hotbox Manager. The Hotbox Manager is the central interface to create, manage and modify your Hotboxes. You can launch the Hotbox Manager by the Edit menu Hotboxes. By default, Mario Extension Pack will install several standard Hotboxes to your system. Some of them are examples to just show you how to set up your own Hotboxes and don't really have any function inside yet. Then we have standard hotboxes, such as the palette ones, steady stroke, etc., which are already set up, including a hotkey, so you can use them straight away. Let's dive into the interface a little bit. On this left side, we see all the installed hotboxes. These buttons interact with this hotbox list and allow you to, for example, create, delete, duplicate, etc., the selected hotbox. Here we have the buttons list. The buttons list shows all buttons that are assigned to the selected hotbox. On the right side, we have the general hotbox settings for the selected hotbox and button specific settings. So if you select a button, you can specify specific options for this button only. At the bottom, we have the general preview tab. So you'll get a preview of how your hotbox will appear once you use it. Finally, at the bottom here, we have some general nice little information bits from the documentation just to give you some quick starting points and give you some information that you might not be aware of. Creation of a new hotbox is as easy as clicking on the plus icon. This allows you to name the hotbox and you get a new blank hotbox to work with. You can delete a hotbox simply by pressing on the X button. If you want to use an existing hotbox as a starting point, you can use the duplicate hotbox button. So this again will let you name the new hotbox and then we have a duplicate. You can create submenus in hotboxes. Here we have an example with a submenu. Let's check this out inside of Mari. If I press the assigned hotkey, I have the submenu button here. If I click on it, I get a second hotbox. I can use the back button to go back to my previous hotbox. Setting up a submenu can be done with this button. So if I create a new hotbox and create a submenu, I get the secondary submenu that I can also assign buttons to. The name of the hotboxes correspond to the name that the hotbox is saved in on disk. So each hotbox corresponds to a folder name. You can rename a hotbox using the rename tool. If you want to open the folder where the hotboxes are saved in, you can click on the C icon. You can see under the Mari folder, so in the same folder where your config file is saved, there's a new hotboxes folder. And in here, all hotboxes are saved. If you want to back up your hotboxes or share them with colleagues, you can easily just copy the folders here and paste them into the target folder on the target machine and the new user will also have these hotboxes. Finally, we have a revert button here. If I make changes to existing extension pack hotboxes, so for example, if I delete a button here and I want to revert this hotbox to the default, I can use the revert button and this will reset the hotbox to the default it was when my extension pack was first installed. Hotbox sections are separated into a top, center and bottom part. If I add a button to the top section, it will appear above the center and here. So if I make a unique name, it appears in the bottom section. If the selected hotbox type supports it, you can also add something to the center. You can always rename a button here. There's a new name. And the name in the list here changes. The list name is separate from the label that actually appears on the button. So we'll cover this in the button sections later on. But quickly to just take a look, here we have a display name where you can actually define what is displayed on the name. So here I could name this test. And I would change to test. Let's first cover the hotbox settings. The hotbox settings are global settings for the hotbox. They can always be overwritten on a per button level. So here we can, for example, set some general behavior, set the shortcut, positioning, and the style. You can also activate a backdrop. And if I make this a bit wider, you can have a custom backdrop behind your hotbox. At the top here, you can save general presets. Presets can be saved for all settings in here. 
so you can use this to define a custom style and apply it to your own hotboxes. The first setting to define is obviously the shortcut you want to use. I click on this set, you can assign a shortcut. If there's an existing shortcut already in use, you'll see that this is already in use and you have the option to overwrite the shortcut. You can also clear an existing shortcut quite easily. Shortcuts are written into Mari actions. Let's take a quick look at this. So whenever I create a new hotbox and assign a shortcut, a new Mari action will be added. If I go to my shortcuts, the main Mari shortcuts, and go to my Mari extension pack section, in here we have the hotboxes. So here you can see all the standard hotboxes that are installed at the moment, or any that you add yourself. You can see the shortcut that is assigned to each hotbox and change it here as well. You can also this way assign hotboxes to only be context sensitive, for example, only in the node graph. The display name of the hotbox refers to the label of the button in the center of the hotbox. So if I change this name, this will change. Next, we have a very important setting, the hotbox type. We have three types available, the row-based, radial, and dial hotbox. Let's check out some examples of different hotbox types so you can see what each type can do. The brush setting one is a row-based one. As you might have noticed, each one is laid out in a row, so each button is laid out in a row, which obviously makes it a row-based one. Canvas one is a dial one, so everything centers around this middle button. Here are some different examples of dials. Here we have a list, which is also a row-based one. Then we have a radial menu, which is quite similar to a dial, but is limited to eight buttons. Another radial one, a row-based one, row-based, dial, radial, row-based, row-based, and dial. The next few settings refer to the behavior of the hotbox, how it is launched and closed. So first we have the launch mode. By default this is on press and hold, meaning that you have to press and hold down the hotkey that is used to keep the hotbox open. If you set this to single tap, you just need to tap the hotbox hotkey once and the hotbox will st stay open, so you do not have to press the hotkey down. These settings here refer to how buttons are executed. So the close on button click will mean that the hotbox will close when you click on a button. Execute on close means that you do not have to click on a button in order to launch a button. So if I hold down the hotkey or press the hotkey and a button is active while execute or close is turned on for this hotbox, the button will automatically be executed. Let's look at an example of this. I'm going to open my palettes hotbox, which is mapped to the backslash key. This hotbox has execute on close turned on. So right now I'm holding down the hotkey that is used to open this hotbox and without clicking on a button, I'm just going to release the hotbox hotkey. So now you can see the button is executed without actually clicking on it. So this is great for muscle memory. So you just press the hotbox hotkey and release it. If the hotbox is set to single tap, so let me change this, single tap. Now I would press the hotkey once. I don't have to hold the hotkey down and just aim and press the hotkey again. And it also executes. The next option under the behavior group is called maintain positions. This option is only available if the hotbox type is row based. So if I switch this to dial, you can see the option disappears. Maintain positions tries to keep the positions of buttons intact even if new buttons are added. What that does is it tries to maintain your muscle memory. So just imagine if you work one year with a hotbox and then you add a new button and suddenly all the positions of the buttons change. Obviously you could manually readjust the button positions, but with maintain position on, hopefully this is not necessary. So let's check this. I have a row based hotbox here. I'm just going to try to add some new buttons and watch the position of one and two here. So if I add a new button, it tries to keep the general position the same. So here, one, two, seven, eight. So the main positions stayed the same. Obviously, this only works to a point because we still work on a grid level here. So the grid cells need to be filled, but at least it tries to keep the positions the same. Next, we have the use aiming option. The use aiming option won't preview inside of the hotbox manager, so I'm just gonna close this and check out 
my palette hotbox. Let me move this to a lighter area. And you might see this little black line that appears from the center and shoots outwards. Use aiming works similar to the Mari or sorry the Maya marking menus, where you don't have to actually be above a button in order to select it. So it just draws a virtual line, and any button crossed by this virtual line will get highlighted. Finally, we have the show tooltips on icons option. When I have a icon-based hotbox, so I have no labels and just icons, usually a tooltip will appear when you are over it. With show tooltips on icons turned off, this tooltip will be deactivated. The time it takes usually for tooltips to appear is operating system specific. On some Linux distributions, I've seen a lot of tooltip spamming, especially on hotboxes that are very densely populated. So for this purpose, I've integrated this show tooltips on icons option that allows you to deactivate the tooltips if it annoys you. Next, let's cover the position group inside of the hotbox settings. The position group houses completely custom attributes per hotbox type. So if I switch to a different hotbox type, you can see all the attributes have changed. I'll try to cover as many here as possible, but I always recommend you read up a little bit in the documentation where everything is documented. So under the Features, Tools, Hotbox Marking Menus, we have everything explained for each of the hotbox types. Now the first setting determines how new rows are added. You can either switch to upwards or downwards. So here I have a row-based hotbox. If I switch this to downwards, the shape of my hotbox is inverted per section. So the bottom section has been inverted and the top section has been inverted. The max row item is pretty self-explanatory. It is a maximum value of buttons that is allowed per row before a new row is added. Separate settings are available for the top and bottom section. The row step size is an offset value to this. It allows you to create more triangular shapes, such as this. So now you can see each row has a slightly different maximum button value. The row and button spacing just determines the space between rows and buttons. So if I add a value here, you can see I can space this out a lot. And I can also do the same for the button spacing, which is the horizontal space. The center spacing options only refer to the center section. So I can add more space between the center row and the other rows. And I can also offset the two buttons here away from the center button. If the hotbox type is on radial, the position group changes slightly. While the row spacing, button spacing, center vertical spacing, and center horizontal spacing are shared with the row based one, we have a radial indent here. If we check this out, you can see we can indent these two buttons to create different shapes for the radial menu. If your hotbox type is a dial, the position group changes pretty much completely. While we still have the center vertical spacing and center horizontal spacing, the other attributes have changed. Center vertical spacing in this case just offsets the position of the top and lower half of the circle. I do not have any buttons on the center in this case, so the center horizontal spacing in this case would not do anything. The draw width and draw height define the bounding box of your circle. So if I change this to something quite low, the buttons are just simply cut off. The draw width and draw height also define where the cutoff point is for your aiming. If I launch this hotbox, and if you watch the black line shooting out, the black line will eventually just stop. So this is also where the draw width and height comes into play. So the virtual line cannot go past the draw width and height. Using the offset, you can offset the general hotbox, which might be required for certain cases, but usually this can stay at zero. And finally, we have the radius and the squash. I can change the radius to make this bigger or smaller. And in this case, again, I would need to change the draw width to actually accommodate this size. Changes to something like 400, maybe even a bit more. You can see I would get a massive, massive hotbox. Let's revert this hotbox to default. Finally, we have a squash value. We can just squash the circle so it's not as nicely round. And we can also stretch this just by going 
in the opposite direction. Next, let's cover the style section where I will just point out some specifics, not cover every attribute because I think they're pretty self-explanatory. The show center option allows you to hide the center area. So in this case, we can simply hide this button. However, if you have a hotbox where you're using a radial hotbox, so for example, if I use the steady stroke one, then this option is not available. You can also change the highlighting scheme. So if I highlight over here, I have a orange highlighting color, which is the Mari highlight color scheme. You can also use a Maya one, which is a lighter blue, or you can set a custom one, in which case you get a custom highlight color field where you can set your own color. If you're using sliders and buttons, changing the colors here will also affect the sliders and buttons. So for example, I could change the menu color here and I would get a different slider color. So we can also make changes to this part. Finally, we have the backdrop section. The backdrop section allows you to place a backdrop behind everything, which can help to see it better on your Mari canvas. The backdrop section is also affected by the draw size. So if you're using a dial, so let's use this for example, I have a draw width and draw height set here, and I cannot go past the size of the backdrop. So let's say if I go to a large backdrop size, you can see this is cut off as well, which again is the draw width and draw height. You can make a lot of adjustments here and tweak this to your liking. You can set the roundness and you can manually place it where you want it to. So you have a lot of adjustment possibilities here. And like I said, this can be quite useful to see your hotbox better. Now let's finally jump into the button settings so we can have a functional hotbox. Let's create a button and we are ending up in our button settings. So the button settings menu has some basic options. So at the top, for example, we have a status overview. Whenever something is wrong, you should hover over the message and you get the tooltip description telling you exactly what is wrong. So here, everything is okay. Button should be visible. But here I have an arrow saying no action is defined for this button. So basically, the button does not do anything yet. In the behavior section, we can first of show and hide a button. This allows you to hide a button from a hotbox or remove it from a hotbox without actually having to delete the button from the buttons list. If you hide the button, you can see the visibility has an indicator saying hidden by user and in the tooltip, we'll see, okay, the show button has been ticked off. The display name, as discussed earlier, will just change the label of the button. So here we are, we have our custom display name. Next, we have the button type. So now we're finally getting to a point where we can define what the button actually does. I would say 90% of buttons will end up being a type Mari action. A Mari action is basically any feature in Mari that can have a hotkey assigned. So anything that appears in your hotkey editor can be a Mari action. To define the Mari action to execute when the button is launched, we use the button functionality set option. So here we end up in a dialog showing all available Mari actions. Or Mari actions, I'm sorry. Let's say we want to create a menu to control the visibility of things. So let's say I want to use height selected on this button. Now I set it, and you can see under the functionality, I can see which action is assigned. Call this height selected. So we have a better indication what it does. The next button type is Python code. Using this, you can define custom Python code to execute when the button is launched. As you can see in the functionality, now we have no Python code file defined. If I do button functionality set, you can copy paste your Python code in here or write it right now in here. And then you can see, okay, the Python code file is defined. There is no syntax checking in this, so make sure that your Python code works, either using the Mari Python console or write it externally, and then paste it in here to have it launched. Now, if we check inside of the folder that we just created for the custom hotbox, you'll see, okay, we have the script custom button in here. So this is the Python file that is attached to the Python action here. The next available button type is to load an image. So a button can load an image from a file path and then use it as a paint through image. So I'll create a new button, call this image load, and let's define an image to load. 
when I go to my temp directory and choose just an image, and now we can see in the functionality, we see the path that is used for the image load. Let's just try this out. So I'm gonna make this hotbox launchable by assigning a hotkey. And now if I press T and choose my image load, there we are. I've loaded in the image that I defined as the file path earlier. The next button type is to assign a submenu to a button. So let me create first a new button and call this submenu. I'm gonna choose the submenu option. And you can see the color changes here, which is actually defined in the hotbox settings under the submenu color. Now, if I click set now, I'll get a message saying no submenu has been defined. We've also looked at this earlier. The first thing you need to do is you need to assign a submenu to the hotbox. So I'm going to create a new submenu under this selected hotbox. And I'll add some buttons to it just to populate it with something. It's row based. And now we have a custom submenu. So going back to our main hotbox, I'm going to choose the submenu again. And now I get the custom submenus that are assigned to this hotbox. Let's choose this one. And let's make this workable again by assigning a hotkey. And if I press the hotkey and open the submenu, I'll get this submenu that I defined earlier. And I can go back to my main menu. Next in the list of button types, we have a slider and a checkbox. Make a slider or a checkbox here. I'm not going to cover the button functionality set right now. I'm gonna do this at the very end of the tutorial because it's a bit Python heavy. So I don't wanna confuse users too much with this. So we're gonna move on. And next we have these spacers. Spacers are just placeholders basically to make an empty space. So spacer 100% will create an empty space at 100% of the button size. Spacer 50% will create a spacer at 50% of the button size, 25% at 25% and the custom one will create a completely custom sized spacer. So if the custom size spacer is active in the custom style, I can set the custom sizes of this spacer. So I could, for example, increase the button width and the button height. Finally, I can just add some separator lines by choosing either the vertical line or horizontal line. So here we have a vertical line and a horizontal line. By default, these default to the button size defined under the hotbox settings. So in here we have the button width and button height. But same as with the custom spacer, I can override this by turning off the inherit hotbox style down here and choosing a custom size. One thing I would like to point out is that you can always switch between button types without losing anything. So here I switched the image load to a horizontal line, but I can always go back to my original image load and you can see the original image is still assigned. So I will never actually lose anything by switching the button types around and experimenting. I'm gonna skip the visible if section for now and push that later into the tutorial as well. And I want to next talk about the positioning group. The positioning group has a row and a button position. So in this case here, I created all the buttons in the top section. However, I can always move a button to a different section by changing it here in the row dropdown. The button position is a unique identifier per button. So if I check out the image load here, it has a button position of one. The height selected button has a button position of two. So we have the image load here and the height selected here. Now, if I also change this height selected to have a button position of one, then there's a conflict. So you can see the positioning warning saying duplicate positions are found. And if I hover above this message, I'll see which button is in conflict with this button position. Now, this is not a good thing to have, and you should usually resolve this just by trying out a different number that is not occupied by another button. However, even with this conflict in place, the hotbox will still work because I will try to automatically resolve the conflict by renumbering things. Since I'm automatically renumbering things each time though, you might see some weird things. So for example, the image load, the first time you load the hotbox might be in the center, but the second time it might be on the left here. So you should always resolve these duplicate position found messages to have consistent appearance of your hotboxes each time you load them. The custom style section in the button settings allows you to customize a button to make it different from the default style of a hotbox that is set under the hotbox settings. 
So if I turn the inherit hotbox style off, I can make some custom modifications to this button, such as button color, font size, button height, etc. We have some checkboxes down here that relate mostly to icons and how to display icons. The first thing is a transparent background. So this just hides the background color of the button. If I have an icon selected, so I just selected this icon via the icon selector, and then click on use icon, I will have a icon instead of a label. If I now check transparent background, the button will disappear and I just have the icon. Obviously in this case, I use a PNG with an embedded transparency. A note on the icons, they should always be relatively small in size because loading image files from this can take some time. So this would make your hotbox a lot slower to load if it's a big file. The fixed icon size determines how I'm scaling or fitting the icon inside of the button width and height. So with fixed icon size off, I will rescale the supplied image or the supplied icon to fit within the button height and button width. With fixed icon size turned on, I just literally use the icon size as is and dump it into the button. And if the icon is bigger than the button itself, then that's just the way it is. And yeah, you can see the result here. Just a quick note about the icon path in general. In here, I supplied the icon for my temp folder. Now, if I were to back up my hotboxes, obviously these icons would not be included. I always recommend to place your icons inside of the actual hotbox folder. So let me go to my temp folder and copy this over here and just paste it down here. Now I don't actually have to change this path. So let's see what happens when I delete this file from my temp folder. We open the hotbox manager and let's check what happened here. So you can see the visibility has a message saying icon path has been relinked to hotbox. So I always check the actual hotbox folder if the icon cannot be found under the original path. Another special case is when you choose an icon from the Mari installation. Usually you have a function, for example, height selected in this case, and you might want to use the same icon as Mari uses. Let's head over to our MAR installation. In this case, I'm on a beta version. Go to the bundle, media, and go to the icons folder. And in here, we have all the Mario icons. Let's search for height, for example, and just choose this icon. Now, if I hover above this, you can see the path changed to dollar Mari. So basically, whenever I pick something from the Mari installation, I will always keep it relative to the Mari installation. So even if you delete your Mari installation and move on to another version, the path will always be found because I will always look inside the current Mari installation to see if this icon exists. Next, let's look at some of the options that we skipped earlier in this tutorial. First off, we have the visible if condition. The visible if condition allows you to show or hide a button depending on a certain condition. So by default, this is set to always, but I can also switch this to matches context. This will reveal a new option to set the visibility context. And in the visibility status, you can see the button does not work at the moment because the visible if context is missing. So the button actually disappeared from the hotbox. If I click on the visibility context, I get this dialog where I can set the condition where this button will show up. We can select from two contexts, the node graph and the tools. In the node graph, you can set the condition to be a certain node. So for example, you can say it only shows up if the current node graph selection contains a certain node type, such as the vector node. You can also invert this to say only show this button if the current node graph selection does not contain a vector node. The same thing is true for the tools. So I can say only show this button, for example, the blur tool is active. And I can invert this to say only show this button if the blur tool is not active, so if any of the other tools are active. I would like to create a button that allows me to connect a radio node in the node graph to a radio transmitter. Having this option or having this button makes only sense if the current node graph selection actually contains a radio node. So I'm going to switch this to the node graph context 
choose selection contains node and then search for radio nodes. Select this. And now this visibility will say visible depending on context. So I'm not seeing this button in the preview at the moment because obviously I do not have anything selected. So we try this out. But first, let me rename this button. So I'm going to call this connect to transmitter. So it would look like this if the context is met. But I'm going to turn this off. And also let me rename the actual button itself. A bit easier to see. And now let's try this out in the node graph. So I have a radio node here. I'm going to open my hotbox. You can see the connect to transmitter is here. Let me first assign an action to this, which I missed. So you can see no action defined. So I'm going to choose the connect to transmitter and assign this as an action. And now if I select my radio node and connect to transmitter, I can directly connect to this transmitter over here. And there we go. Now, if nothing is selected and I open my hotbox, you can see this hotbox kind of changed in style a little bit because one of the buttons is missing. Now, obviously, we don't want the hotbox to change. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a second button that occupies the same position. So I'm going to show this button. So now we have this button two var. I'm going to just turn this into a spacer. So we have an empty space. Accept this. And if I don't have a radio node selected, now there's an empty space here. If I have a radio node selected, the connected transmitter will show up. There's one problem still, because this button at the moment is always visible, which is not a very good thing. I'm going to switch the visible if to match this context and invert this. So I only want the spacer visible if no radio node is selected. Let's accept this and try this again. At the moment, there's no space, so there's a space. And here, if I select the radio node, then the space is replaced with the connected transmitter. The last thing I want to cover in this tutorial is how to set up sliders and checkboxes. We've seen earlier that using the button type dropdown, I can switch a button to be a slider or a checkbox. Now we ha haven't covered how we can actually link the slider or a checkbox to another Mari attribute. You can do this again using the button functionality. Now I fully expect that half of my viewers are gone now because this looks really complicated, but it actually isn't. So let's first look at what's going on here. I have two different fields. The top field determines how the slider is actually launched. So the value it is at when you launch the hotbox. So you basically need to sample the value of the Mari slider. The bottom part defines what happens if you've changed the hotbox slider. So in this case, you need to update the slider inside of the Mari interface with a new value. When you create a slider, by default, I populate it with an example. So a default slider will change the flow attribute in your paint properties. How do we actually get attributes from the Mari interface? In here we have the example. So we just get, for example, the current tool and print the properties list. So I'm going to copy this part and just go to my Python console, which you can find under the Python console show console and paste this in here. Let me remove this asterisk at the beginning to make this valid code. And then I'm just going to either press evaluate or control enter, which will list all attributes of the current tool. Now let's say I want to change the jitter opacity max slider. So the easiest thing here is just to copy all of this into a text editor and let's just search for jitter opacity. We have jitter position opacity jitter amount. That's the attribute we're looking for. So let me select this. So this is the actual path to the attribute we want. Let's go back to our hotbox. And in here, we just need to replace this path. Place this and make sure we only have one in front each. So this should be red. And down here, we also replace this. 
Again, delete this extra one. Make sure it's all red. And then just press accept. If I now launch my hotbox and oops, I should not do this. Let me go back here and just change some of the hotbox settings so it doesn't actually close when you click on something. So I'm gonna turn off aiming and close on button click and try this again. So now if I click on something, the hotbox doesn't close. And if you watch, now this slider is linked to the jitter opacity. The same thing is true for having checkboxes. So if I convert this to a checkbox and I set the code, the top section samples a checkbox in the MAR interface and the bottom section sets a value in the MAR interface. So again, same thing. I get the properties list and I have an example already populated, which turns on the jitter position on and off. So you can apply the same principle of finding properties and then just replacing this red part here with the new path. This concludes this tutorial and I hope it's useful and you can set up your own hotboxes and marking menus to make your life easier in the jungle of the Mari interface, I should say. So you can get to your options a lot faster this way. Thank you.